Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change. We do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. The ultimate goal of farming is not the growing of crops, but the cultivation and perfection of human beings, is a quote from Masanobu Fukuoka, the Japanese farmer, author, and philosopher. I thought this was an appropriate quote for our discussion today, as our guest, an agronomist by background, is the leader of one of Australia's largest agribusinesses, which seeks to empower primary producers in the country. He's also an author in his own right, having written and produced over 144 songs as a self-taught musician. Our guest today is Mark Allison, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of Elders Limited. He is currently Chair of Agribusiness Australia, Auctions Plus, the Agriculture and Natural Resources End User Advisory Board of the SmartSat CRC, the Agri-Food and Wine Advisory Board of Adelaide University, and a non-executive director of Grain Growers. Mark was previously CEO of Grain Growers, Geminex, Farm Oz, West Farmers Landmark, West Farmers CSBP, and CropCare Australasia. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Limitations, a show where we speak to elite, world-class performing men and women and unlock the secrets and influences that have shaped their destinies and then you could apply to your own life. I'm your host, Greg Robinson, Managing Partner of Blender Partners, the number one research-led executive search and board advisory firm. Having been CEO of six organizations, Mark shares his thoughts on real leadership, losing the dreamland, not chasing the butterflies, and just running things properly. By looking after your people and the community, being respectful to your suppliers and shareholders, and being transparent to everybody, we gained an insight to one of the most successful turnaround stories in business. During his current tenure, Elders has grown from a market capitalization of 50 million to 1.85 billion. In a straightforward conversation, we examine the facts and get to the heart of the matter. From the droughts to the bushfires, from politicking to pragmatism, from innovation to infrastructure, and from seven secrets to destination somewhere. So sit back and enjoy. Do it for the right reasons. Mark, welcome to the show. Uh, great to be here. Mark, what was it like actually growing up in the sugar cane and beef cattle family? Uh, it was it was great. Uh, I love North Queensland, uh, and uh, I uh, enjoyed every moment of my uh, of childhood and growing up, uh, shooting, fishing, hunting, camping, uh, swimming. It was just fantastic. What was the key point for you to follow it as a career? Well, I think trying to match what you do professionally with what you love personally is always difficult. And for me, there's a direct match, yeah, agriculture, regional rural Australia, and what I love. So as it's turned out, it's been a perfect match. And did you see yourself moving into the corporate world or did you see yourself moving more towards managing land, like becoming a farmer or, like, or you know, having a large estate? Yeah, I didn't really see myself moving uh, so much into the corporate world as I have. Uh, I, I saw myself more, uh, at uni it was a toss up between doing vet science and agricultural science. And I, I thought agricultural science uh, gave me a broader touch across uh, uh, many other areas rather than just small and large animals as, as a vet would do. But I really, uh, I thought that I'd be, a, a, I'd want to be a very, very good uh, agronomist. I didn't uh, expect to do much more than that. And where did you think that was going to take you? Well, I, I just wanted to uh, to do what I love doing. As I say, I love regional rural Australia. I love agriculture. And I figured if I could uh, sp have a role that kept me in the bush, that'd be uh, fantastic. As it turned out, it was a stepping stone to doing a lot of other stuff. So what really changed then? The plan was to work in the bush, but you obviously 
working both in the bush and in the city for many years now. Yeah, I, I think uh, after I did my egg science degree, I did an economics degree, and then I did some postgrad business stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I found that uh, I really loved it. I really enjoyed it. Uh, all of the patterns of data that I saw in agronomy and, and in uh, agricultural research, I saw in economics, and then I saw it in business. And uh, basically, I've since uh, then, I've seen the whole world in these patterns of data, relationships, cause and effect, and, and I love it. Is that, is that the strength that you bring to the role? Is it the fact that you, you can see patterns quickly and act on them? It may be, but I, but I do uh, I do very much, uh, this is how I think, how I manage how, my music, uh, my yeah, relationships is very much, uh, I see the world in, in patterns like that. Okay, so where was the, uh, the first big break, Mark? I think as a research agronomist, uh, uh, the, uh, back in the early days, the... Uh, the commercial people thought it'd be a good idea if some of the techos got some sort of commercial experience, so at least they could talk the same language. So I was given a small, uh, a small uh, sales territory, and really enjoyed it. Uh, did very, very well, and uh, and then uh, realised that uh, well, actually the the company thought that I may be better served for the company uh, doing more commercial roles than uh, than technical roles. If I look as it stands now, prior to walking in today, what you've had six CEO roles before walking in here today. Well, for all our audience out there who are CEOs, aspiring CEOs, young and upcoming board directors, what does it take to become a CEO? And, and also, what, you know, how, many, how can you be so successful? This is the sixth, going on the seventh time. Well, what's the key learnings? I think the most important thing is to be doing it for the right reasons. And, and to me, the right reasons is to, uh, to get an overall outcome that everyone's wanting to achieve. Uh, I think the leadership aspect is a different aspect. If your driver is simply to be a CEO, then it's uh, it's a monodimensional uh, aspect. If your driver is to uh, contribute strongly to developing the team, for the shareholders, for the community, for your customers, developing yourself, helping your family, uh, then uh, then it's like a diamond. It's got lots of facets, and it's uh, it's quite valuable. Do you want to sort of give us a bit of a few of the, uh, I guess, the key points thus far in the career and what gets the turning points as a CEO for you? The major turning points probably come late because uh, I, was a, uh, I was a CEO relatively young. But the major turning point was uh, in, uh, so after my sixth CEO role and I decided to go into into non-executive career, I was doing that for, for four or five years. And uh, a colleague in Boston uh, said to me that they thought that I was uh, best served not wasting my time doing all the bits and pieces of non-executive work and to go back to having a real job because the greatest I'd ever achieved as a CEO I hadn't achieved yet. And uh, I thought that was a nice throwaway line, but it, it's turned out to be absolutely right. So that was the major turning point. And that opportunity presented itself in, in what form? I was a non-exec director of elders and uh, at the meeting where I'd planned to resign as a non-exec director, uh, the uh, chair was changed and uh, I was uh, voted in as the chair. Uh, and, uh, and then after that became executive chair and then, well, in the midst of our search for a CEO for Elders, uh, the board asked me to, to be the CEO. So that's where I am today. May I ask before we um, talk a bit more about that, that career step and um, Elders, you mentioned the passion for doing the role, but also different to being leadership. And what is leadership to you, Mark? It's a really good question because I've never really understood. I, I uh, you know, back in my, my whole life, I've been in leadership roles. And even if I, I think at high school, someone nominated me for school, school captain because uh, I thought it must have been part of the prank. And of course, I, I nominated my, my mate who was by far best qualified to do the role. And when everyone voted, I, I was voted school captain. So obviously other people see things in leadership that I don't see. But my observation of leadership is uh, that it's uh, around uh, calm, consistent, authentic, uh, real ability to bring everyone together for the, for the shared objective. I think it's as simple as that. If we look at the eight point plan at Elders, uh, it's a very basic 101 of operational plan. And yet we're in the top three companies in Australia in terms of employee enablement and engagement on our strategy. And uh, it just just says the consistency, the calmness, the methodical, authentic combination of everyone coming together to develop the strategy is what it's about. Because uh, as I say, I know it's not me, <laughs> so, so it's got to be some other aspect that uh, has people feel, feel that, yes, this is the right direction. So Mark, what actually is Elders? So Elders is a pure play agribusiness, uh, been around for 181 years this year. It's the old style agricultural company throughout regional rural Australia. So we've got 440 or so points of presence and each of the branches of Elders will have a merchandise area, a fertiliser area, a general merchandise area, a wool area, a, a cattle area, a sheep area, an insurance area, a banking area, a technical service area. 
and, and so it's a very broad based uh, business um, throughout uh, throughout Australia. We have a business in China as well, a very small business. Uh, we've been there for for ten years or so. Really, it's uh, served regional rural Australia in both selling inputs to the production function, but also selling um, outputs from the production function uh, to the world. It's a real fabric. It's a real backbone of the country, isn't it? It, it is. It is. And, and you know, it's it, like if you want to tingle, go down your spine. In Kyneton last year, when the, one of our young branch managers uh, passed away unexpectedly, right. uh, to see uh, the main street of Kyneton with pink shirts on both sides of the street in his funeral procession, uh, you, can, you can understand the fabric of, of elders. It, it's deep. You know, we have customers that are four, five generation customers. But if I came to join Elders, and I had, but I had another competing offer, and I made a few phone calls and someone said, no, no, don't be silly. If you go over to Elders, that, that company's really going to look after you. What is it about the organisation? What is it about the DNA? I think it's a good question because Elders is 181 years old this year and, and it has a deep DNA. I ran Landmark, the competitor, for a number of years. I never wore a green shirt. With Elders, I, wore a pink shirt, I wear a pink shirt every day. I was uh, totally happy in my non-exec uh, uh, life when I was asked to be chairman of elders and uh, really felt like I had nothing to prove in agriculture and yet it was deeply important to actually help elders uh, get back out of uh, almost insolvency. So so I think there's a couple of aspects. One is the elders point, which, which is for me is is deep and real and, uh, and I've got a lot of experience with other companies obviously where I've run them. The other aspect, I think the way I look at uh, what you'll get at Elders, and, and maybe it's by having an ex-agronomist as, uh, as the leader, is you know, in order to grow a good crop, you need to fertilise, water, <laughs> take the weeds away, look after the pests. And I think that's the sort of environment. We, we just, just want to set up for people to be successful and for the, them to be their best. So the management team of Elders that were the losers that had the business almost insolvent, I didn't change. So what did you walk into? What did you inherit when you said, you know, you said you, you're on the board, you made chair, and then suddenly you're chief exec. Why did you take it? What did you think you could do with it? Well, well to me, it was clear and obvious that the business uh, could be successful, you know, over a couple of years' time. And uh, it had all the ingredients. And I, I said at the time as I, when I became chair, yep. when the analyst said, well, what are you going to do differently? And without meaning any offence to anyone past or present, uh, my answer was, we're going to run it properly. And that means uh, lose egos, lose consultants, lose uh, uh, dreamland, lose butterflies that we're chasing all over the place and actually just run it properly. Focus on your customers, look after your people, be, be committed to your communities, be respectful to your suppliers, uh, respect your shareholders, be transparent to everybody, be willing to share what you're doing uh, and uh, just run, work hard and run it properly. So why can't other people do that? Because you, you make it sound so easy, but it's obviously it's not. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a starting line to one of my songs uh, where I say, it's never so easy when you know the truth. <laughs> okay, so, so I think de knowing the issues, dealing with the issues may be, may be different. Okay, well, just, just on that, you've, uh, we may step away for, for a second and, um, well, I guess, Mark, pause for a second because um, I'm going to play something you know quite well. Two, three, four, Lena, gonna do a bit. Tonight, pretty Lena, teach me everything that's Bitcoin right. Do you want to talk us through what made you write that particular song? And what is your talk about the love affair with music and how it inspires you? So that song, uh, Bitcoin uh, Trade, I wrote so two, two years ago. I, I generally record an album each year and uh, with 12 songs or so. I recorded an album and then I had so one extra song. And I thought, I'll try something completely different. Uh, so I decided uh, just to have an idea, walking into the studio, and to write the words and music in the studio on the day. And so Bitcoin Trade is, uh, is an example of that. I was driving to the studio trying to get uh, in the mindset, away from a corporate mindset and into a musician mindset. Uh, I got a text from a colleague in Hong Kong named Lena. Who wanted me? Who was encouraging me to trade some bitcoins because it had dipped off? Yes. Uh, I told her that I was in the midst of uh, becoming a musician, which meant I need to lose any financial capability at all, and and just rely on passion and belief. When I walked in the studio, that was top of mind. Uh, so um, I wanted to write a song with a bit of a Latin feel, uh, as Bitcoin uh, Trade has, and that's how it rolled out. And so the lyrics uh, you can send to a psychologist to analyze, but uh, the the lyrics basically just flowed then, then and there. And is music your escapism? No, I, I think music's probably my reality. 
I think these the lyric expressing lyrics and expressing my view of the world is yeah that's that's where I live you know it's between your ears. <laughs> and how many albums have you recorded thus far? I think there are nine. I've got 144 songs now. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it's yeah, that many. And you go by the name of uh, Mallison. So uh, so I just take the C out of the middle. Yeah. All right. So you've done six CEO roles. All of them have an element of difficulty. Is there a consistency in what you find and also what you bring in each of those roles, Mark, in preparation for them? We get to the elders. Was it much different? I think predominantly it's uh, so for me, obviously, a research agronomist, economist, and business. So, uh, and, and even music is very mathematical, as you, you probably know. So, so data. And patterns are very very important so so basically I, I think it's around the clarity and running the data to the truth uh, so that we can make decisions uh, I think every every single business that I've run there have been components of what management's been doing uh, that is uh, what I, uh, I put in the chasing butterflies category which is something that's really interesting really stimulating but not core business <laughs> and uh, a lot of time and effort spent on that if I think of uh, in fertilizer days soil analysis five percent of the business versus urea, MAP, DAP, uh, yeah, 85%, and then 10% something else. So, so I, I think clarifying and focusing is probably the key key point. And, you know, and most of them have been uh, either crisis or turnaround situations. So when, you, so when you say that it's a crisis or turnaround situation, is the data there and not being seen? Is it, or is it just too difficult to make the decisions to make the change? I think the data in most situations is mostly there. I think that people can look at the same data and see different things. Um, so I think that the subconscious bias drives a lot of further decision making where things start to go wrong. I think a um, self-justification, a protection of legacy can be there distorting or diluting the data. I remember a discussion with one company where it had gone from 85% market share to 65% market share and the senior management team uh, after kind of I'd gone through it a number of times uh, said to me oh Mark now you you're completely mis misreading the data and I said okay how do you mean and and the they explained that it, it wasn't just 85 down to 65 or whatever the market share decline was because each year there was an individual event that occurred so that, that me saying that we'd lost market share was just completely wrong and I'm saying so 85 to 65, but that's 20 points lower, isn't it? Yeah, right. So, so that sort of behaviour. Um, there, there is a lot of legacy defence as well. Yes. I think that occurs. Can you just talk us through it as, as the CEO and the leader now? How do you address the team, and then how do you communicate clearly? So, as you bring everybody in, do you build the strategy slash vision? Does everybody contribute? How do you go about it? Because obviously, you're a man that understands the data, and you're going to bring out some, so I guess, some challenging questions during those number of discussions. So can you talk us through how you structure it in that way? Yeah, so Elders is relatively unique as an approach. At the time, we were, we were lucky to pay our people. So you are about that much on your knees? You're just yeah, about going? In Bad Bank, asking suppliers to extend uh, their uh, their payments so that we could actually pay staff, those, those sorts of things. At, at that time, I uh, basically got rid of all the consultants, all the externals, uh, investor relations, all spin people, uh, and uh, got 40 of the senior managers together, most senior managers of elders together, and we sat down for uh, two, two and a half days. And um, on the, with the, I set the backdrop of return on capital being higher than weight, weight average cost of capital as a driver of shareholder value, so a very basic concept. Yeah. I set that, drew up a matrix, put all the parts of our business in the EBIT ROC matrix. Yep and said, okay, we need to move that to there by this time or we'll get rid of it, that to there by this time or we'll get rid of it. Uh, so it was a very operational, that, that was the, that's the development of the APON plan. Okay. And uh, from that point forward, uh, we then set up the systems and processes with, our, uh, um, with all of the cross-checks and balances, quarterly business reviews, the, uh, which are multiple quarterly business reviews, the executive committee, the business case approach, uh, the safety process systems review approach, so multiple systems and processes yep. uh, that, that are reoccurring, flatten the structure, so I took two le levels out of the structure did you, did you, uh, yeah, okay. so that we could, uh, so that uh, myself and a, a few of the other senior execs could personally mentor 
the managers on what what we, we were looking for and how we wanted to approach it. Okay. So it's basically uh, mentoring and teaching on business. And the reception was what? What was the reception like when you, when you came in at this eight-point plan? Well, given that Elders, uh, 40% of the business is a livestock business and they refer to agronomists as the haberdashery department uh, <laughs> and as the first agronomist to run Elders, the first agronomist to run Landmark as well. I mean, there, I, I think initially there was some concern but, uh, it, you know, if you treat people respectfully, they treat you respectfully. If you get results, they look at the scoreboard. You know, Dad used to say, just look at the scoreboard, it's easy. <laughs> and uh, they're all very, Elders is a very, very proud business with a great tradition. So I think if it was slow to start with, then it's continually built momentum. And why, why did you not wear the green shirt in the previous role? Were you wear the pink shirt in this role? My thinking at the time was that people in the front end we wore the green shirt and I was a head office guy. Okay. So it's interesting. So whether it was my stage of development yeah. uh, or whether it was uh, the organisation, whereas with elders, my thinking is we're all in it together. And how do you lead on a day-to-day -day basis? So you said you, you put the plan there, you got the eight-point plan, you join the points, done the matrix, we're going to move from here to there, et cetera, et cetera, and focus on what we want to focus on. How do you follow up? How do you engage? How do you communicate? You're already talking about your symbolism and what you're wearing, your, your, the pink shirts, etc. You want to talk us through that? Because this is an unbelievably interesting turnaround story. There's lots of communication. You know, we uh, learned, and I'm sure many other people have learned, that over-communicating is far, far uh, less dangerous than under-communicating. And people like to hear. And even if it's, uh, you know, I say the same thing over and over again to multiple people. I talk to all layers of the organisation. So in terms of... Uh, our, our approach during COVID, as an example, you know, we, we've got, we have an executive committee meeting, XCO. Uh, so we instigated XCO Light, which is a one hour meeting every, every week to make sure everyone is communicated with. Uh, I, I talk directly to the whole of the business, everyone in the business, uh, through, through, really? yeah, through CEO video link ups. During the COVID uh, time, I had, uh, I rang 60 people randomly throughout the business, anywhere in the business, no matter what they were, you know, workshop. Uh, agronomist, what, whoever they were, yeah. and just rang and said, hey, it's Mark here, just checking up on you, how are you? And had the most amazing discussions with people during that period. Um, to me, it's... Uh, people aren't too frightened to speak to the CEO? Well, it's an ag company, right? So I ring up and I say, hey, yeah, John, it's Mark Allison here. And sometimes I get bullshit. <laughs> who is it? <laughs> Don't be a dick. Tell me who it is. <laughs> Yeah. And I have to actually, one of them, uh, earlier this year, I had to actually, uh, just short of giving him a driver's license number, I actually explained some things that I wear at a time. I was there, I was sitting here and I said that. Oh yeah, yeah, it sounds like it is you. Okay, thanks. Okay, now the reason I rang was. So, um, that, but, but that's really important because there's yeah, no, it is really important. You know, and, and having been around in the industry for a long time, I mean, it's not uncommon. Uh, last week when I rang someone uh, and we were talking and I said, so, so that means that I met you 30 years ago. And they said, no, 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 no. It was 35 years ago because when you're uh, doing a uni trip, uh, I remember there's a bunch of you and I've, I've talked to a mate, I looked at the phone and it was you. Uh, so so this, it's a small industry and we know each other. But it also shows respect, right? And, uh, and you know, if, if any relationship has a triangle of trust, respect and understanding, I mean, those three are absolutely critical. And respect, it's like why I never turn up late to a meeting. Because the minute I'm late to a meeting, I'm showing that my time's more uh, valuable than theirs. And it's not true. So I think it's just basic humanity, to be honest. And how did you go about, I guess, again, for all our chief execs or senior leaders out there, going through a lot of change, I, which we all are through COVID, how did you go through, Mark, and saying you're in and you're out when you're assessing your leadership team again at haste? This is one of the key points of the story, I think, because uh, the, the executive team uh, that were the executive team when we were in Bad Bank, I didn't make any changes to. So it's the same people. And those people largely are the heroes that are the uh, probably the most successful ag team today. And, and I love that thought. Interestingly, at a point prior to becoming chair, I was approached to head up a private equity bid to take elders out and to establish a separate team. And under that model that I was playing around with, I had replaced all of the executives <laughs> with guns from the industry, but under a, uh, under a, a steady state uh, executive cha or chairman, executive chairman model, I felt that it was inappropriate to do that and rather that uh, we would spend time working together and getting better together. So, And everyone stepped up as much as you thought they would? Yeah, I think some more, some less. But so on average, yes. 
Uh, a few few have left the team for various reasons, uh, but the core, you know, the core probably seventy percent of the team are there, and um, there's obviously a deep pride and a deep satisfaction out of what's been achieved. And what about managing those uh, those external stakeholders? How do you how do you keep them at bay, but also at well and truly informed? Yeah, so if I, I look at investors in particular, so what what were they after when you were chair? Did they want you to to sell, or what 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 was it? Oh, they, they just wanted to minimise their losses. I mean, I, I think that's uh, the, at the at the when I became chair, it was to okay, let, let's try to get something you know north of eighty cents in the dollar back out of this. That was at fifty cent share price, and we're now sitting at eleven twenty or something like that. So can I just just take you back a bit? So you're sitting on the board. You've got a previous chief exec. We won't necessarily go into that. But where, where where was it going off the rails? If you actually prepared to become chair and slash exec chair, then become a CEO, like you said, you obviously saw something there for a classic you know, textbook. Where was it going off the rails? Was it not knowing your customers? Was it not knowing your product? Was it not listening to your own staff? Like what were the key learnings that you could see? Thinking, okay, give this to me. I think I can do it. Turn it around. I think it was uh, for whatever reason there were a bunch of flawed decisions. And uh, without apportioning blame, there, there were a bunch of flawed decisions. As a specialist in agriculture, my sense was that there are multiple areas where uh, the wrong pathway was being taken. Uh, but being careful not to step into management, I kind of made my point and then left it alone. I think as an executive, as chair and executive chair, I could actually do stuff. <laughs> so, so we did. You've also had it hasn't been easy, Street. You've had bushfires. How did the outer elders go through all that and how's the... From the uh, natural environment impacts. With bushfires, we're not strong through the dairy areas, a lot of the coastal areas where there, uh, where a lot of the uh, New South Wales and Victorian bushfires were, so we were pretty good there. Kangaroo Island was a, a difficulty, so um, you know the, more than half of the koala population were wiped out on Kangaroo Island and the sheep population that there's... Uh, so it was very, very difficult and we're rebuilding there. We're doing everything we can to help with other with other uh, members of the community working in the world of rural how do you manage risk because there's a thing called weather out there there's these natural events how, how do you account for that yeah I, I think it's it's one of the fundamentally different views that i have in running an ag business to most of my colleagues so first thing and it's been my whole career and uh, because it seems to me with farming and uh, and certainly th this was this i mean we obviously we didn't have rain problems up north <laughs> which we can you have to have a cost you, you control what you can control okay so you can control your cost you can control your capital so you have a cost and capital base that you make good money in bad seasons and you make great money in good seasons and then you you diversify your business on multiple aspects in order to uh, to offset the risk i mean it's pretty basic yeah but if it's so basically there'll be a lot more wealthy farmers in this part of the world yeah, but but uh, I mean they're not trained business people. Farmers aren't trained business people. They're, I mean there's a blend of their lifestyle, their tradition, their history, and but but if you look at it clinically, and you can see the economics and, and research agronomists coming out of me here, if you look at it clinically, yeah, cost and capital base, what that's what drives the whole thing, and and so with elders, you know, we took what uh, twenty five million out that first year of our cost base in two thousand thirteen. So we reset our cost base, we reallocated capital to the higher return on capital areas, and we've, we've managed capital and cost in a highly disciplined manner ever since. So last year in the greatest drought for 100 years in Eastern Australia, our result was equal to our record. It wasn't recorded, it wasn't reflected in, uh, it wasn't reported, I should say, it wasn't reflected in share price, but that, that, they're the facts. So we're basically flat with our all-time record. It's around... Uh, I, I think the, I mean, it just, our catch cry and our line is that 5 to 10% growth through the agricultural cycles, through the eight pound plan. That's, uh, and we got that from our investors. So you mentioned uh, managing external stakeholders. Yes. I got rid of all consultants. So the investors to me are our consultants. So I got rid of investor relations as well. I have open dialogue every single day of the week with investors. Uh, I asked at the end of most meetings, I asked their advice on what else should we, should we do. They see lots of case studies. They see lots of examples. They've got their own vested interest, uh, but largely, I mean, th their ideas are actually interesting that we can work with, and it's totally transparent because I, I can't see any other way to do. It. I, I can't see any downside. You also um, you stressed a couple of times you've moved on the consultants pretty quickly. You a fan of consultants, or there's a time and a place for consultants. I think if there's uh, specialist and expert knowledge, there's a time and a place. But but I, I think when you're being paid as a CEO and then you pay someone else to do your job for you on strategy, it's, it's a cop-out. Uh, I mean, I've, I've felt that for probably the last five or six CEO roles.
Standing back, how is the industry? How is Australian agriculture placed at the moment? And and going forward, I think it's um, I think Australian ag is is okay. We've slipped behind in our uh, infrastructure investment. We've certainly been doing a part, playing a part to encourage the government to look at that. In terms of our productivity, it's been flat since '97 across all ag. So uh, there's a lot of money yeah. being spent on uh, R and D uh, with the uh, the RDCs throughout agriculture. But an overall guiding national good investment plan. Uh, I think is needed, and I think Minister Littleproud uh, has announced or is going to announce something like that. And I think our, um, the acceptance of agriculture through regional, uh, through uh, metropolitan Australia, has dropped off a little, uh, particularly when we've had uh, GM debates and um, some chemical debates, the glyphosate debate and animal welfare debates. And, and I think there needs to be a little work there as well. But overall, uh, I think in terms of uh, market access uh, and pr uh, production, it, it's fine. Well, what's the what's the national framework that you've you've been pushing? So, so in terms of R and D, all of the research and development corporations per commodity, whether it be grain or meat, as two examples, yes. or horticulture, so they they get levies from farmers and they're matched by the government. And so the argument of farmer groups is, well, because the levies are paid by farmers, the farmers should say where the research is is given. And so then you get lobby groups directing research into areas like frost in esperance, whereas there may be a greater need with sorghum in the Darling Downs. So the argument that we've been running is, well, hold on a minute, 50% levies are from farmers, but 50% are from Australian taxpayers. So surely there has to be an overarching national good, national interest uh, prioritisation of R&D. Yeah, that's, that's, that's actually been taken up now? We believe so, yes. You mentioned also, also the flat productivity since 1997. Is that down to R&D and technology and not coming together being smart about what we're doing? I think that's uh, that's a big part of it. But when we look at the big productivity jumps in agriculture uh, over over this period, uh, they're generally industry restructure. So sugarcane industry taking growers out of production and making it far more efficient. Uh, dairy taking growers out of production and making it far more efficient. And I think that there's a good lesson in those two points. The biggest productivity jumps recently have been through industry restructure. And the other big jumps in agriculture have been around the introduction of Roundup and glyphosate with conservation tillages to significantly reduce the amount of tillage, reduce the environmental impact, and have a major, major benefit on Australian agricultural productivity. Uh, and that's, of course, is lost in some of the glyphosate debate, but uh, that's another point. Uh, so so I, I think it's around identifying um, protein-based meat crops, uh, identifying um, better genetics. There's a whole heap of various. And compared to, say, the, the likes of well, the emerging markets of South America and the Baltic states, are we losing our way against them? Yeah, well, we've lost market share in grain for a few years now. And, uh, and with beef, uh, with uh, South America, Brazil coming back in and Argentina coming back in, uh, it'll be the same. So I think, you know, there's the share question versus the absolute question. So if we've got $60 billion worth of production at Farmgate, we export $40 billion. And, uh, you know, the markets, ASEAN market, uh, uh, you know, there's 1.2, uh, sorry, there's 800 million people. China market, 1.4 billion. And then uh, the North Asia market, Japan, South Korea, a, a very a developed market. So, so we've got lots and lots of opportunity and lots of areas for growth. And I think looking from a market share viewpoint doesn't give the full story. But is it coordinated well? Is that your point? You know, like everyone talks about that market. Is it coordinated well? And as a as a country, are we maximising this potential that we have? I think we've had a few own goals. I mean, we had a an Indonesian market that we were uh, ticking along beautifully with, and we had great bilateral stuff happening, great respect, trust, and understanding. And then uh, we pulled the plug on uh, on cattle, their major beef sports source that they were kind of overly exposed to Australia on and left them in the lurch. And, and then w we shouldn't be surprised when they bring Indian buffalo in and now they're getting South American beef. Uh, China's another great example. Have we ever, ever recaptured that, that market in Indonesia or that's, that's it, we've lost? Well, a, a chunk of the market has gone to um, Indian buffalo. So it, it's, and it's uh, endorsed and uh, incentivized by the governments of Indonesia. So it's changed forever. But, but you, you know, relationships are relationships, whether it's countries or people yep. or business associates. Yep. Once you lose trust, where do you go? So Indonesia, and again, put yourself in their shoes. Uh, I think empathy is one of the key uh, characteristics we need in a lot of these negotiations. Put yourself in their shoes. We are overly, exp so it's like the Australian debate on China, yep. except they had, what, 80%, 85% of the beef coming from Australia. Well, we're overexposed to Australia. No, Australia will never do anything to jeopardise our beef supply.
and let me close down live export. It's fine because there's a massive market and we're a small player. So we'll find our markets and, uh, and you know, like uh, China, our beef into China through all these geopolitical times has increased 24%. So that's part of the story is that, you know, major issues, geopolitical issues, and yet we've increased. The second part of the story, which is important, is that Brazil's exports to China has increased 250%. And what about um, barley and wine to China? That's all up for the discussion at the moment. I think the barley example is, is an interesting one. And again, uh, it's been uh, communicated in a certain way that has people believing certain things. But uh, from my viewpoint, the barley anti-dumping uh, action was taken two years ago. Uh, we've been working on them on the Grain Growers Board and we've been working through it uh, over that period. And uh, I think the, uh, the final decision to, uh, to put the 80% tariff on uh, was flagged well out. And anyone who planted barley knew it, that there was a potential tariff going on barley to China. The concern that this was a cliff-faced decision is, is just not what happened. And also, we, we couldn't justify to their department that, that there wasn't uh, dumping of selling below cost. Other part of the story, India put a, an 80% tariff on chickpeas uh, in 2017, uh, mid-crop for chickpeas in Australia. And they did that openly to protect their local market because they got a monsoon and their chickpeas could be grown. Now, that was fine, same impact, and, and barley's been put into the geopolitical washing machine uh, as one of the issues. Uh, with wine, uh, I'm not across the detail to the same extent. The World Trade Organization has a mechanism if there's a selling below cost by countries for them to act. Australia's taken that action against China, I don't know, 200 times a year for the last five years, and we've, we've got a couple of agricultural ones that have come back to us. Does Metropolitan Australia really understand the opportunities and the challenges that rural Australia faces? Uh, I don't think so, and I, I don't think regional rural Australia understand the uh, <laughs> the issues in metropolitan Australia either. I mean, there's some crossover, but they're fun it's fundamentally different. I mean, as you know, there's, I mean, you go to regional rural Australia for the last six months and uh, questions COVID what? How much do we need to invest as a nation in R&D? And the second part is, I did ask a guest not long ago who said to me, no, that's out, that's completely wrong. Australia is not the food bowl of Asia. That's been a myth for a very long time. Is that true? Uh, on the expenditure, I mean, if depending on all the money you count, so if you just count RDCs, it's something like $800 million a year spent on R&D. Yep. Uh, and then if you count CSIRO and unis, you know, it's, it's doubled or tripled. I think we're, the, the money's there. My point is around prioritising the money into the key productivity areas. So, so we run the three lines of uh, productivity, profitability and sustainability, which is the, a critical part for agriculture across the world, but particularly in Western countries and particularly in Australia. In terms of the food bowl, I, I'm not sure if it makes any difference. We produce, by data, we produce 60 billion, roughly. We export 40 billion, so 20 billion for Australia. So let's say that the export of six of oh, forty billion can feed, uh, say, fifty million people. So let's say sixty million people, and there are two billion people. So if you're a food bowl or a snack bar or whatever you want to describe yourself, that, that's the data. They're, they're the facts. Where are we um, as a nation regarding water and water policy, and the, and also thereafter infrastructure for the land? I think from a water viewpoint, again, you've got to blend out facts and reality and seasons and all that sort of stuff. I, I thought a really interesting observation from um, Professor Forrest Reinhardt, who's a, a Harvard Business School professor. He did a case study on uh, the water system in Australia and then contrasted it with California, which is the, uh, the best Western world contrast. Mm -hmm. And then also some of the European stuff, I think, in Spain. And, and his, uh, his conclusion was that we have our system, our trading system, our management system, our policy is world-class, best in the world. And, and so uh, it's quite interesting because if you... Because we're hearing a lot of noise about it all day long. We hear quite different noise. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, uh, and I, I think that's why taking an objective view on this stuff is really important. I actually read the report on the fish kills. Yep. And the, the, a, big, a big chunk in there was around overpopulation because of uh, uh, so much water available. Uh, so it's, like it's, it's, not, it's not a farmer stealing water story. What about offshore investment in buying, buying land? Is that smart as opposed to being maybe thinking about maybe lease the land instead? Economic terms, direct foreign investment drives innovation. <laughs> and so, so we need foreign capital. We, we need uh, investment. And, you know, let's get really practical here. You know, the land's not going to be towed behind a bus and dragged away overseas on a boat or something. Uh, so I, I think there's, again, cut through. What are the reasons for this thinking? 
because yeah, personally, when I talk to growers, well, a lot of it's nationalism. Yeah, yeah, and nationalism is good if it's for us, and it's bad if it's for the US and yeah. China. Yeah, well, and Russia. it's also are, are you are you going to be employing Australians, or are you not going to be employing Australians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera? Although any overseas person being employed has to go through our normal immigration system, yep. right? And most people in Newtown don't want to work on farms. So they want to have their lattes, etc. cetera, in Newtown. <laughs> well, I agree. Well, that brings us to the next point, because what, what are we doing at the moment? Well, we, the, the poor old farmer out there at the moment is throwing the fruit into the ground because it's not being picked. Now, how can that happen? Well, it's crazy. I mean, there's, there's a shortfall. In, in, in horticultural areas, there seems to be a shortfall of around 50,000 workers. 50,000? 50, yeah, through, through the season, yeah. So, And these are the kind of German, Korean um, backpackers, etc., uh, but and government is taking um, great action in in uh, with Pacific Island workers uh, being being brought in. So that's that. But, but we've actually got the people to do that in Australian cities. Well, they're, they're receiving funds at the moment. If you're out of a job, you're getting you're getting money. So why are we applying those people to say, why don't you go and live in the bush for a few months and get paid and try something different? And great idea, and uh, that's the beauty of a democracy. They can say no. So what's the what's the what's the loss we're looking at here if we can't get these um, these farmers looked after? My sense is that uh, there will be some losses, but largely we'll work around it. Okay. Now, rather than the farm out in regional rural Australia, what about the small town? How's unemployment going there? How's future prospects going for Joe Blow, Mrs. Joe Blow, the youngsters coming through in, in rural regional townships of Australia? I think it has been declining for many years but but this period of COVID, it's one of the silver linings because people being able to work remotely yep. has uh, has driven a lot of interest in fact our our regional our real estate business particularly closer into cities has had a bit of a jump uh, on that basis and and we'll see if it actually changes forever or, or whether it's a uh, it's um, you know everyone migrates back into cities but, but my suspicion is that there'll be a big chunk that'll change forever i i think the uh investment in regional infrastructure, nation building infrastructure uh, will be critical. And, and it's one of the areas that we've been falling behind in agriculture is our uh, supply chain costs from production to ports. And I'll give the example uh, for Northwest New South Wales, where it can cost twice as much to get wheat from the uh, Northwest to Newcastle as it does to get it to China. I'm looking forward to that infrastructure, nation building infrastructure. What, and what does that come in the shape of? Is that train line? Is that well, what is it? You know, what what, what, are you, what are you hoping for? I, I think it'll depend on the um, the efficiency studies, but it, it's either upgrading train lines, it's it's uh, road transport. There may be other mechanisms for air transport, like Wagner in in Toowoomba. Yeah. yeah. So so there's if for horticulture. Um, so I, I think it can come in many forms. So there's that aspect. I, I think the idea of uh, bringing um, tax cuts ahead uh, makes very very good sense. It's an interesting um, observation that having balanced budgets. Uh, being the critical issue. COVID has shown us that you can move from capitalism to socialism in three months, Correct. which we've done, yep. and we'll be doing for the next 10 years. And there's been no wars, there's been no fights, there's been nothing, hardly a debate. So it's shown that, and uh, it's happened, it's, it's where we are. Yep. And it's also shown that if the political system had allowed us, we could have done that and invested in water projects, in uh, inland development projects, in port projects all around Australia, and got the same deficit as we've got with COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, now, obviously, the political system won't allow us to do that, but it just demonstrates. The government hasn't gone broke. We haven't stopped paying public servants. Um, we've printed money. No, we have printed money. <laughs> we're borrowing a lot of money. Don't right. yeah. we're, but we've got to repay it back one day. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's the theory. That's the theory. Yeah, well, the, the, but the South Americans didn't, and the Africans didn't. And, you know, <laughs> that's the theory. COVID. Mm -hmm. How's it affected your business? All in all, as a, an essential industry in agriculture, it's had minimal impact. We acted early, so we've got business uh, business in China. And uh, from Chinese New Year, we'd started putting the plans together there, which meant that we'd actually thought through and uh, developed a lot of the plans uh, from an Australian viewpoint because it was top of mind from uh, yeah, four months earlier. For wool, it's been an impact, and that's largely out of um, European demand for fine fabric. So uh, I think what it's done uh, for us is given us time to reflect and think. We went to uh, contactless uh, serving of clients from day one. And, and you know, regional real Australia, as I say, our branches with the instructions and the protocols put them in place immediately, very practical, very real, and uh, it was business as usual. And the, you, you, know, you made a note, the concept of repatriation of supply chains for security against China, et cetera, is a little bit of a nonsense. 
What, what does that mean? The thought that we can somehow bring all of our, from an agricultural viewpoint, all of our uh, active ingredient, like chemical active ingredient manufacturing plants to Australia over a six week period, yeah. it's just not practical. I mean, there's millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of investment and economies of scale that are driven off access to the whole world because Australia's not large in the whole scheme of things. Um, so, and, and even, you know, the, the example I was particularly thinking of when I said that wasn't an Australian example, it was the example of, uh, of Apple saying, okay, Foxconn, who's the Taiwanese company in, now based out of China, making all the iPads and iPhones. Uh, Foxconn, uh, we're going to do it ourselves now. We're going to repatriate to the US. Foxconn's immediate response will be, okay, I wonder if we can find a chip somewhere. And so Apple lose like half of their market share while they're deciding where in Australia the unions are going to allow them to discuss the environmental impact study that'll show if they can put a plant somewhere if the Democrats aren't elected in order to make sure we have a focus group to consult before we decide, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the real way to look at it is the critical areas. In that agricultural chemical example, formulation plants in Australia, completely different issue. Low capital, uh, quick to establish, then you actually formulate the product in Australia rather than making the active ingredient. If that makes sense. Yeah. We can do that. Like it's, it's appropriate. That's more the R&D stuff again, isn't it? Similar? As opposed to large scale manufacturing of it? Yeah. That's right. It's, it's not the heavy manufacturing. So, so in various areas, I think it's possible, but the idea of whole scale uh, doing this and, and isolating yourself from the, what will be the number one economy in the world and the closest proximity economy is just nonsense. You see Mr. Trump has encouraged manufacturers to come out of China back to the US. Have we got the scale to even consider being serious about it or, we do, or do we play the smart game like you're talking about, develop the product and get the and partner with the right countries to manufacture at scale? I think the symbolism is nice. And it's, uh, <laughs> I agree. it's, it's really nice. And, and remember for the U S the, the, the major, <laughs> the, the manufacturing industry in the U S one of the massive impacts has been the uh, North American free trade agreement that had the manufacturing going to Mexico and the symbolism is fantastic. The, the issue we've got is do we have low enough labor and energy costs? We don't. Then it needs to be subsidized. And if, if we decide that we want to be a, a country that subsidizes manufacturing, like we did with the, uh, car industry. That's the decision that can be made. All right, because I was going to say to you, my next question was that the PMs talked about six priority areas, which include food and beverages, which to be focused on under the under the broader plan of manufacturing. Yeah. Good symbolism. No, no, in those areas, I mean, there's, there's some real stuff. I mean, for specific areas, I mean, for processing with uh, meat and veg, for transport hubs, for uh, uh, supply chain facilities, there is a big impact. That may not be the high profile stuff that, the uh, newspapers like to write about. But there are multiple areas. I mean, we've, we've got, uh, in South Australia, we're talking about, we've got the environment to grow uh, pulse legumes and broadacre crops in winter. And we've got a direct sup supply chain into China where plant-based protein, fake meat, is uh, taking off on the top end. Yeah, right. So, so it just makes sense. And we've, we've spoken to the South Australian government around how, if we align proximity to production, yep. processing facility in South Australia, and a transport hub into the key markets, particularly into China and, and North Asia, uh, then you've actually got something that's legitimate, that makes sense. And it's not symbolism, it's actually making money. What's been the big plays in technology and innovation in your sector in the last five years? And also, what's the big things you want to share with us today, which are, we should we start thinking about? Yeah, I think in ag tech, uh, and, and for me, this is bread and butter from my agronomy days. I, I love it. So. I've, I've led a couple of ag tech tours to Israel who are the world leaders in, um, in this area. In are they really? Yeah. Well, the, Israel, I think, is the only country in the world where the desert's getting smaller every year <laughs> because they're irrigating it deep, with deep uh, drip irrigation. There are a lot of really exciting uh, innovations from drones to uh, like remote sensing, the satellite uh, technology. Uh, there are too many to speak about, but the broad concepts are the ones we had in the 80s uh, when I was a kind of excitable young agronomist yeah. of variable rate application. So you only put as much fertilizer as the plant needs on the crop uh, at, in the place that you need to put it. So it's very, it's precision yeah. and it's variable. So you don't get wastage and runoff to reefs and things like this. Targeted pest applications again. So it's very targeted. You don't get any runoffs in rivers. You, you don't have any of that sort of stuff. Much softer technology at lower rates being used. Uh, something that I, I really uh, quite enjoyed was, um, so it's like a drone, except they're photography on commercial air, air flights, which means they can be much higher 
with the idea that because they're, they're going over all the time and there was a white fly on a crop uh, that they took a photo of from up. And I said, well, but what's the resolution like? Because it's very, very high resolution. Yeah. And he showed me the photo and you can actually see the veins in the fly's You're wings. you kidding. And I thought, wow, this is, you know, rather than my day where we went out in the paddock and put a square, meter square around some plants and counted the bugs. Yeah, right. Do you think how that we structured as a, um, a sets of political parties that rural Australia is really getting a decent voice? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question because it's a catch-22 because as a minor party, the nationals don't have a voice no. unless they're in coalition. And by being in coalition... They um, they lose their voice on some of the big issues, <laughs> so um, it's a difficult situation. I mean, by weight of population, and you know, throughout the ages, throughout the world, population wins, right? And you know, the policy to contain China, population wins. But look at the scoreboard: three hundred million, one point four billion. Yeah. Uh, and eventually, uh, probably if India wasn't a democracy, if it had a central government, it, it'd be there sooner rather than later as well. Yeah, true. Uh, population wins. That's how it works, and uh, and regional rural Australia doesn't have the population. An interesting twist will come now with this remote uh, working, yeah. and I think I think the voice of regional rural Australia will become stronger. Where where do you see other opportunities for us as a nation offshore? So so there's there's a long way to go. Um, I think uh, in ASEAN, uh, so uh, still under tapped, are we? Absolutely, yeah. And as it as the ASEAN country develop, uh, and it's more fragmented, which, which makes it more difficult on one side, but also makes it um, easier for, for us to target in others on another side. So if we look at the growth of Vietnam, I mean, some of Thailand stuff, Indonesia in particular, Indonesia as a key market, and through the smaller ASEAN countries, uh, I think there's a lot of room to move. What happens for us in regards to um, to Brexit? Are there, are there going to be opportunities there for us? Because I mean, we got dealt with pretty harshly a number of years back in the old days. To go on grain, what, what's there for us there, Mark? Uh, I think so. so we're, we're doing uh, the free trade agreement with, um, with the UK is being negotiated now. And, and there will be opportunities. The way I'm seeing it, the you know, UK opportunities uh, versus uh, developing country opportunities with 2 billion people yep. that are close by you. That's about your people thing again, doesn't <laughs> yeah, it? Yeah, it, it seems to me that that's where we can have our uh, greatest influence and our greatest impact. All right, greatest impact. What's the best song you've ever written? To be honest, I, I like all of them. <laughs> uh, there's 144, but uh, I, I particularly, if I think of the songs that, when I listen to them, still have an impact on me, just hearing the words. Songs about uh, my father, my mother, my grandmother, my grandfather, my kids, because they're all written with a deep emotional occurrence. Something's happened, or something's happening. Uh, interestingly, I, I wrote a song for my father and like the last, I think the second last thing he said was uh, "Be brave." So the songs, as you asked us, will be brave. And uh, every time I think about that, I'm, I'm sitting with him when he says that. And where did it all begin? Is this going back as a young young kid at university or earlier? Yeah, I've always liked music, but I taught myself. So I've I've got this problem with pianos and guitars that I've got a finger cut off, so it's very difficult for me to play. And so I never played. And when I was 18, I taught myself to play, and uh, but but it means that I can't. I can't hold the string down. So, oh, right. and yeah. when I'm recording now, if I'm playing a lot of guitar, it bleeds because it's, it's kind of soft tissue under here. So, I, ta I taught myself to play. So, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I self taught musician. Yeah. And as my boy and my middle boy and my daughter say, who are trained musicians and their mums are pianists, uh, uh, as they say, yeah, dad, you got three chords well done. Pretty colourful life you've had. If you were to look back at the young Mark today, as a young agronomist, hmm. and look back, what advice would you give him? I'd say something like, uh, enjoy, just simple. Because I, 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 I think the ability to enjoy is in not having it entrapped by any other expectations. Well, Mark, thank you very much for joining us today. I can't ask for any more than that. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> You've been listening to No Limitations.